Hey, good morning, church. Would you stand? Let's celebrate the Lord with us. When the doubt in my way tries to steal what you say, saying I have no reason to praise, I will give thanks. Yes, I will give thanks. baptism today uh, good morning so this is Dan and sunshine call and Dan is here and he's gonna be baptized by Jacob Thigpen and then Dan's gonna turn around and baptize his wife sunshine so Dan I have two questions for you do you believe that Jesus is the son of the living God amen have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior all right on that Jacob will baptize you in the name of the Father Son and Holy Spirit 
Sunshine, I have the same two questions for you. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of the living God? Yes, I do. Amen. Have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior? Yes, I have. Amen. On that, Dan will baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, would you stand? Let's continue to sing.
Heavenly Father, we turn to you this morning, singing these songs to you, declaring, trusting, putting our faith in you, knowing that you are a firm foundation for us. You are a place that we can put our confidence. You are trustworthy. You are faithful till the end. We know that you will not fail us. And you've shown that to us in the cross of Jesus Christ. And if you can show that kind of love to us, we know that you're worthy. We know that, that you're trustworthy. We know that you love us. Despite our circumstances, despite whatever season we're walking through, if you can take care of our greatest problem, our sin on the cross, then we know that you're faithful in every situation we face. And we thank you that when we walk through the valley, you are our good shepherd walking with us, that we never walk alone. So I pray this morning that we would put our trust in you, that you would help us do that, that you would strengthen us, that you would invite us, that those of us who haven't put our trust in you that are here in this room today, we would respond to you this morning. We put our hope and our faith in you. We ask that you be glorified in this day. Ask your blessing over everyone in this room. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. You may be seated. Ah, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. Welcome to Sunday Services. My name is Mark. Oh, my goodness, we have a whole line back there. Uh, if, you have, if you can move into the center so we can get all these people seated. Um, if you have a seat next to you, could you maybe raise your hand? Can we adjust a little bit? So there's plenty of seats down here out front um, if you guys want to come on down and check it out. All right, good problem to have. Thank you for being here, everyone. Uh, a couple announcements. First, uh, if you're new, I want to recommend that you scan the QR code in the seat in front of you. Uh, that'll get you to a landing page uh, where you can uh, connect with us. There's even a, a form you can sign up or just fill out and connect with us. Let us know that you're here. Uh, you can get to our website, uh, our Facebook page, our YouTube page. Those are the places mainly uh, where we're going to keep you connected with uh, all of our content that we're providing uh, to keep you connected to Jesus and to each other. Um, if you're a member, you consider this your home. You can initiate online giving on our website uh, on, under the Give tab. You can also give a physical gift if you are here uh, on the back wall. Throughout those back doors, there's a box, uh, an offering box. You can uh, put your gift in there. Uh, a couple announcements for what's going on around here. Coming up is Trunk or Treat on October 8th. That's a, just a couple Saturdays away. Uh, we want to invite you to that to come and uh, be with us here from 3 to 5 p.m. There will be food trucks with food available and uh, inflatables here in the building. And then we'll have uh, a bunch of trunks where kids can go from trunk to trunk to collect candy out in the parking lot. Uh, if you want to come, please join us. There's no registration or anything. Just invite a friend and be here on that Saturday. I hope you've gotten some invite cards that we're passing out. Uh, take those. They're, it's an easy way to, to invite friends, to invite your coworkers. Just, just take them, okay? Because they do us no good in this building. They do us no good in this building. Uh, take them and hand them out. Throw them down Detroit Road as you're driving home. Uh, let's just... No, don't do that. Don't do that, Okay. Uh, but no, invite people. This is a super easy way to get people here uh, to our church. Um, if you want to host a trunk, though, we do need some more trunks still, several more trunks we could use, uh, and as well as some volunteers for the inflatables, that sort of thing, the parking lot crew. Go to the events page on our website, and you'll see a sign up for volunteers. Uh, please do that today so we can get our, our, our planning kind of uh, wrapped up. Uh, this year, American Heritage Girls, our American Heritage Girls troop, uh, is working with uh, Samaritan's Purse for Operation Christmas Child. And here's, here's a quick video about it. Three, two, one. And when those lids come off those boxes, you have never seen such pure joy. This is amazing, as you can see. The children's faces, they are excited as they open up the gifts for the first time. What makes the gifts more than just gifts is the message that comes with the gift. This is the opportunity for a child to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. The mission of Operation Christmas Child never changes. Children are coming to Jesus and children are taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. 
Millions of children around the world are being impacted by these simple shoebox gifts. One box can touch not just a child, but a whole family. So we need to keep packing those boxes and pray for the children that God will use this in a very special way. So thank you for being a part of it. God bless you. All right. That's Operation Christmas Child. Those are the shoe boxes that get stuffed and shipped around the world. Our HG troop is shooting for 100 boxes this year, and we'd love for your help to fill those boxes. Go to our table out in the atrium and find out how you can uh, participate. There's four different ways you can donate and help be a part of this. Uh, so be sure to check out that table out in the atrium on your way out so we get those boxes shipped out this year. After service today, there's a Kids at Hope meeting. If you're a volunteer for Kids at Hope, uh, you're asked to come to this meeting after this service. It'll be around noon. Um, if, you're, if you want to be a part of Kids at Hope, maybe you are thinking about volunteering back there. We have a need for volunteers back there. Uh, please come to this meeting after service. There's no sign up. Just join Pastor Zach uh, at noon. And I think it's going to be back in the East Wing Worship Center. He's providing lunch. He's providing child care. Uh, so please, if you are a volunteer or you want to be a volunteer, uh, please make plans to be at that, that Kids at Hope meeting after this service today. And then finally, we had two baptisms. We want to celebrate one more time. Dan and Sunshine Call were baptized just a moment ago. And that's pretty awesome. That's all I have. Let's continue our sermon series. Good morning, and those of you joining us online, good morning to you as well. Thanks for being with us today. Before we get to the sermon, obviously, things are starting to pick up church-wise. It's been a little bit busier here. This service in particular is getting really, really full. First service is starting to get full. I want to let you know that there is a little bit more room in first service. The talks of a third service, we had two services to start, then we went to three, then COVID hit, then we kept doing three. There was no child care for the third, so we went back to two. And then as soon as we went back to two, everybody was like, we're coming back. So, so what do you want from us? We don't know what to do. <laughs> Here's the deal. Here's the deal. Like, we want to move to a third service. We're going to wait, you know, to see, because it needs to stay this full. But it's a, getting a little uncomfortable. We've got some people out in the atrium, and, and we understand that. Once you hit, like, 80%, you need to start looking at another service. But that third service has to have child care. It just has to have it. The, this is a church filled with a lot of young families, and there's a lot of kids. It's a very fertile church, is what I'm saying. <laughs> so, because of that, we need child care. But in order to have child care, you need volunteer. Oh, good. You guys know how it works. So, uh, once we start, you know, getting closer to that, we're going to start making announcements. We're going to start calling for volunteers. And really, it's going to be, it's going to be on you guys. If you're okay being a little bit comfortable and squished in, then we won't do a third service. And, and that'll be indicated by whether or not we're going to get the volunteers that, that we need. And it's not a ton of volunteers. It's what, maybe like 20 or so additional volunteers. I'm looking over at Bob. <laughs> I'm not looking at the wall. <laughs> um, about 20 or so volunteers that we need. So it's not a ton, and a church our size, this shouldn't be an issue. But I want you to know we're aware of it. We're starting to get people coming up, talking about third service. You know, are you guys going back? It's getting uncomfortable. And, and we get that. And again, as we move towards the holidays, it's only going to get more and more full. But this is a good thing, church. <laughs> this is a good thing. Um, yeah, we can applaud what the Lord is doing here. Like, this is great, and I'm glad you're here, but what's super exciting is that was baptism 41 this year. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. We're super thankful, uh, not just, obviously, for the numeric growth, but the spiritual growth as well. So here's what we're doing today. This is week four of our Psalm Sermon Series. This is halfway point. This is a two-month series. This is our halfway point, and what we're doing in this series is we're taking a look at the book of Psalms, and we started off in week one with this kind of bird's eye view of the Psalms, and we talked about how one of the major themes that runs through the Psalms is praise God on all occasions. And then in week two, I started taking a look at the first of seven categories we're going to go over from the Psalms. And we looked at Psalms of Lament. That was category one. And we talked about how you can lament. There's examples of lament, feeling sorrow and grief, but how we need to lament well. 
And God's Word gave us some steps on how to do that. And then last week we talked about Psalms of Thanksgiving. And we talked about the difference between gratitude and thanksgiving. And how thanksgiving is the expression of gratitude. And today we're going to take a look at another category. Today we're going to look at Psalms of Enthronement. Psalms of Enthronement. And psalms of enthronement are similar to psalms of thanksgiving in that there's no real structure, no set structure to a psalm of enthronement. It's a little bit looser. It's similar to psalms of thanksgiving, very different from psalms of lament that follow the structure of there being an address to God, a complaint, a request for help, an expression of trust, and then a vow of praise. Psalms of enthronement are different. So what are psalms of enthronement. What is enthronement? Well, enthronement is this. That's enthronement. Who is that? It's King Charles. So Queen Elizabeth died a few weeks back, and Charles automatically became king, but this is Charles sitting on the throne as king before parliament for the very first time. This is enthronement. Coronation's different. Coronation involves a crown. His coronation is going to happen sometime next year. But this is enthronement. And this is also going on my Pinterest board for outfits. (laughs) I've been thinking about a midriff chain. I don't know if anybody thinks that that would look good on me. But, But this is enthronement. Enthronement means to seat upon a throne. That's what enthronement is. And when Charles became king, when Queen Elizabeth died... He was recognized as king, but when he sat on that throne, he was really recognized as king. And that's what psalms of enthronement do. They recognize, they focus on God as king. And what I want to do this morning is I want to spend a little time and read some psalms of enthronement. We'll start with Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders the Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all cry glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. The Lord sits enthroned as what? King forever. Psalm 93. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. You are what? Say it with me. Throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. Your throne is established. You are from everlasting. Psalm 95, we read this one last week. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great what? Say it with me. King above all gods. He is a great king above all gods. Psalm 97, the Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his what? Say it with me. Throne. Psalm 47. Clap your hands. All people shout to God with loud songs of joy for the Lord the Most High is to be feared. A great what? King over all the earth. He subdued people under us and nations under our feet. He chose our heritage for us. The pride of Jacob whom he loves. Selah. God has gone up with a shout. The Lord with the sound of a trumpet, sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our who? King. Sing praises. For God is the who? King of all the earth. Sing praises with a song. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy what? Throne. Make no mistake. God is king. He's king. He's not your co-pilot. He's not your homeboy. He's not your buddy. God is king. He's king. 
This is why some of the language in the church these days is driving me nuts. And when I mean church, I'm talking about the organism of the church, the people, Christians saying things that just don't make any sense, and they don't acknowledge and recognize that God is king and that he's everywhere. Language like, Holy Spirit, we invite you to this place. And this always happens when we start singing songs or when people start praying and it's more of your presence, God, more of your spirit. We invite you, God. Your presence is welcome here. God, what are you, nuts? He's God. He's everywhere. He's everywhere. We don't have to invite him. That's not how it works. That's not what the scriptures teach. When I was, uh, about a decade ago, uh, when I was, Seven. <laughs> I was a part of this young adult ministry, and I was on the leadership team. There was about nine of us on this leadership team. And what often happens in churches and in ministries is they've got this idea. Let's get everybody together. Let's unite all the churches together. You know, it doesn't matter what the denomination is. Let's get together because we're all praying to the same Jesus, right? Wrong. You're not. You're praying to different versions of Jesus. And the thing that separates denominations more often than not is doctrine. It's not preference. It's not that the church down the street, you know, the pastor likes to wear a suit and a tie, and people like want, they want their pastor to wear a suit and a tie, and you guys are apparently okay with beach wear. <laughs> Some of you are. I get a lot of weird email. <laughs> right? And so that's not the only thing that separates us. It's, it's doctrine. It's your version of Jesus requires that you do certain things that the scriptures don't teach. And so it's, in, it's people adding to God's word. But every church has this idea, every pastor or leadership team has this idea, let's get everybody together and we're just gonna all get along and it's gonna be great, nothing's gonna be weird. But it always gets a little weird and a little strange. So we're doing this event at a church in Cleveland. And it's an old church in Cleveland and we're going to meet and this leadership team's gonna meet and pray before the event. And so we go down in this basement in this back room and the door opens and it's like, ee! it's like terrifying. It's just a scary environment. And so we all get down there and there's eight of us. We're missing one other person. And we start praying. We're praying, you know, God, we just ask that we, you know, we wanna bring you glory tonight. We wanna to honor you tonight. And things are going along. We've been praying about four or five minutes. And all of a sudden we hear the door open and, and, and we know that it's the, it's the last member of our team. And before this individual got in the room, all the way, in the most Nicolas Cage way I have ever heard, this person was like, more of your presence, God. More Holy Spirit, we invite you. And I remember sitting there going, what? First of all, you just got here. You know how much Jesus we have. What if we had all the Jesus we needed? And you're bringing, well, you want more Jesus? We've got enough. But I remember sitting there thinking, that's not how it works. That's not how it works. We don't need to invite the Holy Spirit. When God gives you faith, he gives you the Spirit. He gives you all of the Spirit. You don't get bits and pieces of the Spirit. You don't ask God for more. You don't invite him as if you're doing him for a favor. God is Everywhere, this is what the Psalms tell us. Where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed and shield, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. God is king. God is everywhere. His spirit is everywhere. You don't need to invite him to your lady's tea. He doesn't need to be a special invitation to your men's breakfast. You don't mail him a trunk or treat card. He's there. He's there. So as long as I'm here, we're not going to use that language here. We're not going to feel like we need to invite God or place him on the throne. He's already on the throne. That's where he is. Rant over. <laughs> Let's move on. God is a king, but he's not a king like Charles is king. What kind of king is Charles? He's not really a king, right? Not in the traditional sense that we understand. 
King Charles is the symbolic representation of Britain. Apparently, British people want him to wear that outfit with that chain. Like that's what they want. He, that's all he is. He doesn't have any real authority. I watched part of the uh, address that he did to Parliament, and it was so old-timey, which is kind of cool. But he got up to the microphone, and he was like, to the House of Lords and the House of Commons. And I thought my wife would love this. She loves all that old-timey garbage. She does. She likes all those shows. She'll be like, do you want to watch this show with me? And I'm like, do these people in the show have access to aspirin? <laughs> do they have access to aspirin? She's like, no. I'm like, I'm not watching the show where somebody's going to get a fever and be dead in two minutes. That's not what we're doing. Do they have indoor plumbing? No. If it doesn't have indoor plumbing or access to aspirin, I'm not watching the show. <laughs> That's just where I'm at in life. I'm not going to get attached to this character and they get poked by a stick and six days later their leg is gone and they're dead. Like, I'm not doing that. I can't take the emotional roller coaster. I want things that are in space. I want semi-trucks that turn into robots. That's where I'm at in life. <laughs> I'm preaching today. I don't know if you guys can sense. <laughs> He's not a king like Charles is king. He doesn't have limited power or no power. God has all power. Let's go back to the Psalms. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to who? God, all power belongs to God, and God is all powerful. He has all the power. What power? All of it. All meaning all. Complete, comprehensive. He lacks no power. And these Psalms of enthronement focus on this. They recognize this, and they celebrate this. Go back to Psalm 47. Listen to this. This is a celebration. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our king, sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with a psalm. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. These psalms teach us to recognize and celebrate God as king. And I don't think that that's a real stretch for us. I think the majority of us in this room, the majority of Christians, have no problem getting on board with celebrating God as king. We can sing our songs. We can pray our prayers. This is not a problem. Here's the thing, though, church. God doesn't just want our celebration. He wants our submission. He wants our submission. God does doesn't want us to celebrate him as king and go, oh, what a great king, king of kings and lord of lords. We bow down to you, King Jesus. That's good, and you should keep doing that. But he wants us to submit to him as king. He wants to rule you. Here's the reality. Every single day every single day you are alive every single day you wake up you put something on a throne and you make it king every single day every single one of us enthrones something makes it king and lets it rule our day. Maybe it's your job. Maybe your job is king. Maybe you bow down to your job, its demands, whether or not they're moral or not, its schedule, whether or not it's good for your family or not. But your job is king. And so your job rules you. Maybe money's your king. Maybe the pursuit of it based on greed or the stress of it based on need. But when you wake up, you put money on that throne, it's gotta, gotta get that deal, gotta close that deal. Or how am I gonna pay my bills? How am I gonna make, it's your king, it's ruling you, it's governing your actions and your thoughts. Maybe your schedule's king. Ooh, a lot of us worship and bow down to king calendar, don't we? We do. Those of you with little kids in sports, 
Is your calendar your king? Do you bow down and worship the schedule? Henry's five and a half now. It'll be six in January. Rachel and I are starting to have the conversations. Hi, bud. (laughs) Starting to have the conversations. Should we get him in sports? And I'll tell you what, if he does, I will assure you, I don't care what coach or schedule says, he will not play on Sundays, period. We will not bow down to King Calendar. And some of you parents, I'm gonna grind the gear, some of you need to dethrone King Calendar. What are we teaching our children about priorities in the Lord's day? Maybe your sin is your king. Maybe pornography is your king. Lust is your king. Maybe pride is your king. Or fear is your king. Or vanity is your king. Maybe your appearance is your king. Maybe your diet is your king. Whatever it is, every single day we wake up, we put something on a throne, we make it king, and it rules our day. This is why Jesus says what he says to his apostles. Jesus is on a roll. He's preaching, and he's like, oh, and when you pray... Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I think some of us, when we say that, when we read it, when we see it, when we hear it, we think we're praying and asking God to usher in his final kingdom, his final heavenly kingdom. Oh God, bring your heavenly kingdom down on earth and set up camp here, but that doesn't make any sense. Not if you look at the whole of scripture, God's not gonna bring his final kingdom down and place it on this earth. He's gonna make a new heaven and a new earth, and then he's gonna bring the kingdom down to that new earth, so it can't mean that. So read the sentence, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What this means and what it has to mean is that when you pray, you're asking God to come in and be your king. Help me, God, to recognize you, celebrate you, and submit to you as king. Jesus knew, God knew, God knows that every day we're gonna put something else on the throne. And so when he says, and when you pray, pray and ask me to be your king for you to submit, your will be done. That's submission on earth as it is in heaven. God is king and he wants more than just our celebration. He wants our submission. And the truth is, The hard truth is, the uncomfortable truth is, is if you don't submit to the king, you won't be in the kingdom. You won't. And that language doesn't really sit well with some of us. And I'm not talking about works-based salvation here, okay? We've covered that enough. If you've been here long enough, that's that's not our jam. That's not what we do here. God is the one who gives faith but your submission is evidence that you're in the kingdom. And don't take my word for it. First Corinthians six, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. This verse is really challenging because what we see is, okay, you won't inherit the kingdom of God if you do these things. And every single one of us is sitting there going, well, we kind of do those things. So if I kind of do those things, 
then am I not gonna inherit the kingdom of God? This is why verse 11 is so important. As such were some of you, but you were washed, sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. This language should sound familiar to you. I've said this a hundred times. Knowing Jesus doesn't make you sinless, but it should make you sin less. And so you look, are you doing the same amount of sexually immoral things? Are you idolizing the same amount of things? Are you still committing adultery? Are you still in the lifestyle of homosexuality? Are you still thieving? Are you still greedy? Are you still getting drunk? Like, are you still doing these things regularly, intentionally, willfully, deliberately to the point that you've made peace with the sin? Or do you have those moments of indiscretion where you blow it and then you pray and you confess and you repent and you try to move in the opposite direction of sin? There's a difference between the two. But if you continually, willfully, intentionally don't submit to the king, that's because you're not a part of the kingdom. He's not ruling you. That word unrighteous in verse 9, or do you not know that the unrighteous, there is no one righteous, not even one. None of us are righteous outside of Christ. But when God gives you faith and gives you the fullness of his Holy Spirit in you, then Jesus' righteousness is transferred to you. You share in his righteousness so that when God sees you, he sees the righteousness of his son, which is why you can be washed and sanctified and justified. God is the king, and he wants our submission. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, let's go back to those horrible, horrible shows Rachel watches. <laughs> just terrible, like just terrible. In those shows and in, in history, kings issued decrees and laws. And so submitting to the king is obeying the laws and decrees of the king. And God, our king, the only king, the king of kings, has issued his laws and decrees. So if you want to know if you're submitting to the king, all you have to do is examine what you do and figure out, are you submitting to his law? I don't know if I'm submitting to the king. Well, are you living with your boyfriend or girlfriend and having sex outside of marriage? Yes. Okay. Does the law, does God's law permit that or prohibit it? It prohibits it. You're not submitting to the king. Now you've got the information. Well, we love each other. We're going to stay in this committed relationship. We're going to keep doing what we're doing. Ooh, now we're treading on dangerous territory. Why aren't you wrecked by your sin? Are you a part of the kingdom? You know what? Now that we see this, we're going to move out. We're going to stop being intimate with one another. Ah, there we go. Submitting to the king. Just one example. If you don't submit to the king, you won't be in the kingdom. And how we submit to the king is through obedience to his law and his word. Church, make no mistake, God is king. He is king of all. He has all power. And I think sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we forget that he desires and demands and commands our obedience. He's king. And the difference between God's law and man's law is certainly exponential. But God's law is always good. It always produces fruit. God's law is not selfish, not self-serving. It is to bring him glory, but that's glory that he is due. So we can trust God's law. We can trust to the point of submission. God is king. So let's sit in this for a little bit. I want to ask you if you feel comfortable just to go ahead and close your eyes. 
I want to take us through uh, an exercise here of visualizing some things. I think this is an important tool. God gives us the ability to do things like visualizing. And this is not a name it and claim it type of practice. You're not going to visualize your new house or your new Ferrari. That's not what we're doing here. I want you to picture a room and I want you to picture a throne. That's your room. Whatever is on that throne is what governs you. And I want to ask you a question What is your king? Honestly, what's on that throne most of the time? What are you thinking about most of the time? What's ruling you most of the time? Is it King Jesus? Or is it your schedule? Is it your kids? Is it your sin? Is it your pride? Is it your appearance? Is it money? Is it fear? Is it stress? What are you enthroning on a regular basis? Take a minute or two. Ask the Lord to reveal to you if you've got something else on the throne other than him. If the Lord has revealed to you what you have on that throne in your life, I want you to take a moment and confess to the Lord your failure in this area. I want you to thank him for his forgiveness. I want you to thank him that you've been washed clean, justified, and sanctified by his work. Throughout the majority of history, people became kings by really one of two ways. Either the king that was there died and the successor came. The heir to the throne took the throne, just like Queen Elizabeth and Charles. But then there's also a part of history where kings were forcibly removed from their throne. Whether justified or not, it happened. And I suppose we could all sit around and wait for our sin to just die on its own or King Job or King Stress or King Vanity to die on its own. But I think the better way would be to dethrone it forcibly. And so I want you to picture whatever it is that you put on that throne that is not Jesus, that is not the Holy Spirit, that is not God. I want you to picture going up to that throne picking that thing up and just tossing it out of the room. And I want you to back away from that throne. And whatever you visualize God as, watch him sit on that throne. And then in the most old-timey way I can say it, bend your knee to the throne bow down and worship the king. You see, the truth is, is God's already on the throne. We just need to recognize it. So now that we're in a spirit of submission, let's move to a time of celebration. And the seat back in front of you, you should see a communion pack if you could go ahead and grab that. The top portion of that is a piece of bread that represents 
the body of King Jesus that was crucified as that final perfect sacrifice satisfied the law satisfied God's wrath and paid the penalty for the sins of those whom he would call children let's take let's eat the bread and let's celebrate King Jesus Underneath that, you should see a cup of juice. That is the blood of our king that was shed, that was spilled, that was sacrificed volitionally by him to wash us, to cleanse us, to take us from unrighteousness to righteous in the sight of our God. Take and drink the juice and celebrate the king. Father, we thank you for being the king, not a king, not one of many kings, but the king, capital K, king. We praise you. We celebrate you. We want to honor you. And Lord, we want to submit. Holy Spirit, you are dwelling in the, your, the fullness of who you are is dwelling in the heart and mind of every believer. Would you guide us? Would you lead us? Would you convict us in those moments where we're not submitting to you? Help us to celebrate and submit to you as king. For all glory is due your name. We pray all this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So here's your homework for this week. This week, try to be conscious of what you're enthroning. What's ruling your day? What have you made your king? And in that moment, if the Holy Spirit says, hey, your job is king, hey, the money's king, hey, the pride, the vanity's king, stop down if you can. If you need to close your eyes and visualize taking that thing off the throne and tossing it, then do that. Celebrate God as king. Submit to him as king. Recognize he's on the throne and be ruled by Jesus Christ this week. Amen? Amen. Thank you so much for being here. Have a wonderful Sunday. We'll see you next week.